Okay, you can start as we are waiting for the other people coming. And uh, I would like to hear first Mr. Frank Dumas. Yes. Okay. Yes, because you didn't speak before and after I will. Just I want to know also about your implication in blockchain and energy. Well, I've been, uh, I've been on both sides. Uh, I've been involved in encryption and distributed computing back in the 90s. Um, we sold our company, I left, I retired, I got bored, and I ended up in oil and gas uh, in Canada, and uh, mostly as a merchant banker. So I've seen uh, from, from helping developing geophysic technology uh, for oil and gas for mining to uh, financing the projects and uh, financing also technology to extract lithium, uh, things of that nature. And I got kind of sucked back in to technology with the blockchain when people start to read old uh, paper we've wrote in the 90s uh, about distributed encryption. And some people say, well, what was the goal, what you wanted to do and all that. And we start to volunteer our time to explain what was the goal back then, it was not working. Some people figured out, and the people that became our team later on figured out how to uh, put the fix in. And uh, now we have a blockchain company and we have also a decentralized uh, exchange, uh, uh, derivative exchange that we're building. So that's a look, in a nutshell what I'm doing now, so. Okay. I'm a guy with an opinion. Mr. Like all, all these people yeah. are, are know what they're talking about uh, for renewable energy. I'm just a guy with an opinion, so that's it. Okay, I would like that an introduction on the way, Mr. Hanshi. Mrs. Sun. Okay. Yes. yes, I'm the founding partner of Ultra Fund Capital. It's a blockchain and crypto asset venture fund. We're based in Silicon Valley, California. So I may look uh, lost because I flew 32 hours from San Francisco to Malta. I, I left on Monday, arrived on uh, just on Wednesday. So um, if you guys ever come visit, uh, come buzz me and come visit me in San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you. Okay. What is your implication in blockchain and energy? Well, how you invest, your requirement, your criteria usually? To uh, we don't particularly focus on the energy sector. We focus on any sector that has to do with uh, crypto asset and blockchain. So there's no uh, limitation to just energy. And um, you are sector agnostic. So you are sector agnostic. You invest in any sector where yes. receive asset, I, blockchain assets. Yes, black, okay. blockchain assets. Okay, Mr. Gips, uh, Dr. Gibson. About the incentivization of uh, renewable energy, I would like to have uh, your insight. Okay, so um, Ecotech is the distributive smart manufacturing facility that I shared about a little while ago. Um, it's an STO project, so a security token. Um, the, the reason for that is because it's creating opportunity and opening for people in the market um, through the STO framework, um, and customers of the marketplace can benefit from the utility token, which is the Ecopreneur protocol, um, and the protocol is actually taking the data from the supply chain. So I shared before that there are four verticals, space tech, farm tech, energy tech, and um, green tech. And through the supply chain, you can collect data um, from the process. In our facility, we have an in-house trucking and logistics company. Um, and actually, at SF Blockchain Week, one of the keynote speakers was the head of FedEx. Um, and he was talking about the significance of adoption. Um, and in order to facilitate adoption, that the supply chain really is one of the newest and most exciting opportunities for that. Um, so in order to meet the SDGs, we believe that aligning the supply chain and then also creating an incentive for users to collect data on pollution, so for example, in California and Vallejo, I mentioned before there's fires. Um, lots of people are taking pictures, and those pictures are just going on Facebook or on sites that aren't actually categorizing them in terms of the AI. So right now, if you ask Siri what climate change is, she's going to troll Google and give you a super general answer. So there's a desire in AI technology to have um, data that feeds to this conversation and incentivizing 
again, my generation, millennials, Gen X, Gen Z, who is very clear that this is a, something important to them. They're already taking pictures on this topic, but they're not getting a reward for it. And our rewards feed into the products that will be sold through the marketplace. So there's an incentive to actually um, through a shared economy model to collect the data that will ultimately um, reach the goals of the SDGs, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you for your insight. I would like also to have your vision about what, the, what are the challenges to be overcome in this industry because it's very difficult to, to make accepted, as Mr. Hugo say, for example, uh, for the geopolitical reason. And uh, where, where are already the, regula uh, re the, the regulation that approve, the, for example, the peer-to-peer -peer energy or the uh, tokenization of assets? W where do you see that the, uh, where the country that is better uh, um, see the, these models? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, okay, so um, in my opinion, um, like when a country, the more developed a country, the harder is it is to pull out the you know, original infrastructure. So actually uh, block, uh, um, in a blockchain grid with energy is very applicable to third world countries like Africa, where uh, places there uh, that they lack energy because there's no centralized um, energy company, you know, like PG&E. Who's from San Francisco Bay Area? Who's from California by any chance? Okay, all right. Are uh, are you fed up with PG&E's recent wildfires? <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, I'm fed up, but. Uh, you can't change, you can't, you know, take out PGE overnight. And decentralized energy grid uh, through blockchain is, is peer to peer, it's decentralized, it's efficient, you cut out the middle, middle man, say for instance, uh, you're Mr. A, you're Mr. B, you, you live next door to each other, you don't, even though you don't know each other, uh, but you share this energy grid, if you have extra, you can sell it to him for a very reasonable price. So it's decentralized, and, um, but like PG&E controls the pricing and everything and their monopoly, there's nothing you can do about it. So it's, it's a lot of politics there. And um, you can't, like at least in California, you know, PG&E is monopolizing this, this state. You can just say, let's get rid of PG&E and let's install our own grid in each household. But actually, uh, the more backward the country is, like some countries in Africa, uh, some, some places they have test and install um, decentralized energy grid and peer-to-peer uh, -peer, peer, and it really benefits them, it really works very well. Thank you for your insight. If you, you want yeah. to ask too. Yeah, so I have a couple examples of actually working in America um, and I think it, it, just going back to the framework that I articulated earlier about why whales still exist on the planet. So um, government has never facilitated innovation, neither has activism, neither has education. Um, and so those are not the vehicles to facilitate it, hands down. Um, the way that innovation has happened um, around the globe has been because of inventors creating better products and consumers demanding them. Um, and so in New York, there's already a decentralized model of a smart grid solar blockchain pilot. We're also about to pilot one in Miami um, over a small city. It's 113,000 residents. It'll be the largest, the one in New York is over um, about um, two square miles. So the one in Miami will actually be the largest pilot in America. Um, and I think once that's complete um, and, p and communities start to see the opportunity, it's all about the hardware and getting the cost down. And up until um, recently, um, the, uh, the rhetoric around sustainability has been that it's more expensive um, than the current um, system that we're using. It's that same metaphor I shared about um, why we switch from well oil to, um, to incandescent light bulbs. It's because it was cheaper, it was faster, um, and consumers wanted something that would last longer, right? So well oil gas lanterns would last maybe a week, whereas incandescent light bulbs could last a couple months. So the same thing is relevant, particularly in South Florida, where there are hurricanes, um, 
that disrupt the grid and in California where there's significant power outages um, as a result, rolling blackouts in the East Coast as a result of um, climate issues, whether it be fires, hurricanes, um, et cetera. Um, the public is demanding consistency. And once there's a large scale pilot to facilitate that consistency, I think um, you'll have consumers demanding it. Um, part of the model for the smart grid solar blockchain rollout is that the panels are given to you free, um, and that has never happened before. Part of how they subsidize the um, product is they're doing it just like they sell cell phones. So remember, um, uh, with the exception of iPhone, right? <laughs> but you can go to the store, and if you buy a family plan of four, you can even with iPhone, depending on your carrier, you can get four phones for free, right? So solar panels have that same structure. At least some of the companies are looking at facilitating that same structure to be able to roll the cost of the equipment into the monthly bill because you're getting rid of your electric bill anyway, so they can roll that into and, and finance it rolling out. So it really is about um, having appropriate business models um, that meet the needs of consumers so that consumers can access the new technology and then new technology that's viable to be able to work at scale. And I think we're getting there, um, hence the pilot that we're about to do in Miami. Thank you for your contribution. I would like to speak with me, Mr. Frank about the regulatory framework and the adoption standardization. Well, I see that a little bit as uh, I've seen most people in the field, and when I say the field, it's exactly what you're doing uh, with uh, solution uh, using blockchain for, for uh, energy management. And it's really problem solving oriented, where people identify a problem and they're going to come with a solution. and. I see the problem a lot before that, like uh, at the macro level. Historically, the legacy energy uh, market is corrupt and inefficient. And you need the broker, you need the middleman to actually make it go anywhere, or actually to function. Uh, people remember Enron. That was pretty the, the, the best example of uh, taking out of the market the most corrupt element and then realizing that it just reproduced itself in the same week in five different other brokerage firms, and they're back at it doing the same thing because that's how it kind of works. The reason for that is that we don't have standardization uh, at the, the macro level. Uh, we have the same issue also with uh, carbon credits right now. So being either standardized or uh, voluntarily, the carbon credits exist in maybe a few hundred different forms. So from one country to another, and that's just one layer. You're gonna to have to add the layer of the security commission when they consider that your token credit is a security, uh, if, if you wanna tokenize it. And so we've looked at it our, ourselves uh, just as a case study. And the complexity of the smart contract we would need and the computing power to be able to, to run an efficient market versus two guy going to the bar and, you know, next door and managing uh, or, or deciding on a deal that will make uh, a certain grid work for a certain period of time, like they're doing right now, uh, there's a matter of cost and it comes down to the cost uh, all the time. The greatest thing with the blockchain is we take out a good chunk of the corruption and unfortunately, uh, and I'm a libertarian, I hate to say that, but this is probably one of the rare markets where we still need a little bit of corruption. We need the people to, at least, we need a few rogue elements, because the rogue element push the solution to problems that nobody wants to identify. And, and we've seen that time and time again in this business. And I think that's what we're gonna now start to, to, to see now with uh, the people that have all these constellation of fantastic projects. It's a federation or mutualization of the solution and these people start to talk to each other, we'll be able to, to push standardization on the way up. And, and that's where we're gonna see, uh, is the communication between these projects, between the promoters that will make a big difference. And, okay, and now I want to have your idea about the challenge that you see for the next years. For example, the problem of the oracles in, uh, in the energy uh, supply chain management, how you see that uh, we can overcome this, this issue? 
about, uh, for example, the traceability, about the sensor, the EOT, the interoperability with the artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. EOT, machine learning, and other uh, emergent technology and blockchain. Yeah, I think oh. the, the problem in the energy sector is the same problem that exists in every sector, which is adoption. Um, and in order to facilitate adoption, it's got to be made easy, um, less expensive, um, and be marketed and, and put out as something that customers want, um, and addressing problems that are urgent for the public. I definitely, um, in Miami, and I would say the same in, in California, energy is um, one of the most significant areas of concern. I would say that that's also the case globally when you look at communities um, that are lacking energy. The project, the Smart Grid project that I just spoke about um, is also being piloted in, in, in India because it's a program out of MIT and so they wanted to pick countries international and cust company, countries domestically um, to be able to show that this could be done um, both in a developed country but also in a developing rural environment um, and that it works in terms of energy rollout. Um, but I think what's coming in the next few years and, and what I love the blockchain for may be similar to some of the panelists, um, which is the transparency that it, it provides and the open source frameworks allows um, public to, to, to sort of see and participants to see what's happening at all times in an open source frame. Um, right now, um, the current energy um, industry, especially oil and gas in the US is and globally is heavily subsidized um, far beyond the subsidies that have ever been given to renewable and energy. And so even just the transparency again in financial models, I think the public wouldn't stand for that if there was awareness of that. So more adoption on the blockchain and more transparency is ultimately going to facilitate the public's awareness that um, the, the, the deck isn't kind of stacked equally and fair. Um, and that if we understood that renewables are not just cheaper, literally cheaper, because oil is subsidized at such a high rate, um, but also better for the planet and everything else, and, and faster and more efficient, and works in a hurricane or a fire um, the way that the grid does not, I, 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 don't, I think it would be a no-brainer for public to want to make that switch. Yeah, so I want to add quickly, um, instead of uh, the whole concept of blockchain is giving the power back to the people, empowering mm -hmm. people, so mm -hmm. um, maybe instead of like, uh, going through top down through the government and uh, having to deal with bureaucracy, give the power back to the people and we can st uh, start from bottom up. Mm -hmm. We can start from us, you know, each individual have this power grid and then we, it's like Uber sharing. Right now it's the sharing economy, the Uber of, uh, of uh, you know, taxi, mm -hmm. the Uber of energy. So if someone wants to build an app, you know, that will be something we're looking to That's invest. We're okay, yeah. <laughs> app that, that you can share the energy, peer-to-peer -peer energy. Okay, so it's clear enough now that we are in, in front of the monetization of spare energy as the spare room for Airbnb or the car for Uber, as you say now. What is the social impact of this? It's huge because we are in a sharing economy, so it's huge. If you want to shortly say about this. Yes, definitely. Um, Blockchain is revolutionary, it's disruptive, and people uh, that don't understand blockchain usually associates blockchain with Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin fell, people say, oh, well, there's no hope for blockchain. When Ethereum fell, people say, oh, blockchain is a, a thing of the past, but that is not true at all. You don't have to have cryptocurrency to have blockchain, but you have to have blockchain to have cryptocurrency. You can do do without any cryptocurrency, but you still have blockchain. Blockchain is a technology that's uh, here to stay. It's going to last forever. It's like the internet. It took some time for internet uh, adoption, and same as blockchain, it's going to take some time. It's, it's going to be, be a wave, same like internet. Internet to media is like blockchain to ledger. And uh, so instead of doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, writing letters manually, you have email, you have internet. And instead of doing things manually right now, you have this um, blockchain thing. And that is going to um, replace many of the current technology in every sector, not just e-commerce, e fintech, but energy everywhere, everywhere. Is, uh, blockchain is a technology here to stay. I think the, uh, the idea is that... The 
the peer-to-peer -peer action, the capacity to have a social network of energy producer or sharer, it's probably a few steps away from us right now. We're going to need a few market agents to move in that direction first. Uh, the thing is, when you give power to people to do these things, you give them the power to fail also. And it's like people buying stock or buying a cryptocurrency. They go and they buy it. If they make money, they think they're genius. Most of the time, they're going to lose money, and they're going to start to look, what are, where are the, what happened? What, who screwed them out of their money, and, and why? And now they get educated. And the, Yes. and the governance. But, but you won't, you're still going to have humans in the system. So you need people to get educated to a level. And, and that's going to create within the next five to ten years a major cultural shift because they're going to realize, um, you know, they've been taken for a ride for the last hundred years on energy solutions mm -hmm. uh, where they could have actually changed a few small things and, and, and make it beneficial to themselves. Uh, but you need a certain level of education that comes with it, and people right now are going to simple solution, moving, for example, from a fuel uh, car to electric car, not thinking in most energy, or the capacity to increase electricity right now, and the offer is with coal or with uh, uh, carbon or fossil energy. Uh, that's an impact. You, you look at in Canada, for example, somebody that works with us was giving me an example yesterday, uh, where we are, because of the carbon tax that we're implementing, we're moving certain business out of the country or they're reducing their production. For example, aluminum smelter. And these smelters, now that, that demand is still there. So what we're doing is carbon leakage. We're pushing that production in China. We're pushing it elsewhere where the environmental norms are way lesser. So because we want to feel good, we go with signs in front of our own smelter, force them to shut down production, but we make it worse at the end. So there's a level of education and that, that needs to be pushed to the, the retail sector. And then there's a level also of efficiency uh, you know, on, on the blockchain level, on the AI level, that needs to, to come together. It's, and like usual, it's not necessarily the best application they're going to win, but we're going to get to some kind of a... You know, education is first. First of everything, it needs the education of people to make uh, available the mass adoption of the technologies. Thank you very much for this interesting point of views. And uh, I am happy now to introduce also Mr. Uh, Kenneth Rees, if he's here. Mr. He's late. Yes. Um, the, um, uh, in the in the peer to peer and in the, in this in the technology that comes with this, there's a lot more surveillance in the house of people's activities, of monitoring and, and collecting of people's data. How how what are the implications of that? In the big bearing in mind the, 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 the you know the questions and the problems that exist at this stage now, where we've got to with these massive amounts of data being collected and used. What what. Obviously, there's the, the benefits, the obvious benefits that you've talked about, but what are the, what are the, the risks or the downside of all this data being collected in, right at the heart of people's homes about all of their activities and, and you know, where would that go and who would, how would that be used? Uh, because we can already listen to your phone right now and, and build the database out of it, and, and a lot of us know how to do it, uh, I don't think it's going to get worse. I think you're already there. You're already in L. Now, we're going to bring you back to purgatory where we're actually going to be transparent about the fact that we're doing it, and we're probably going to share the bounty with you. We're going to share the profit we're making out of it with you, or give you the option to opt out, which you don't have right now if, you're a, if you have a phone. If ever you have opened a Gmail here, uh, I can tell you very easily where you've been the last 10 years, one meter close, you know, uh, and, and pull out your timeline. So that's, there's a lot of things I can do if I can fit that with a few other data. I don't need that many... Uh, you know, vector or, or that many uh, data points to do that. And, and it's there right now. So you're already in L. Like, it's not something from the future. It's, it's right here right now. Uh, actually, the whole beauty of blockchain is, pri is, is private. You don't get to know who or see who's doing what. So even if Mr. A and Mr. B live next to each other and they don't know each other, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's like you don't know the Uber driver. You don't know who. You just riding his car, just use his energy, just pay for it, pay for the mm -hmm. service. You don't need to know the person. You don't get to know the person, actually. Yeah.
Thank you very much for, uh, for this part, this interesting point of view. I think that it's clear that we are in front, of, we are facing a global challenge.